Hi, everybody. I took the red eye in from California, so I am uh, caffeinated and <laughs> ready to go. Um, the title of the talk is Chimera, uh, which if you are familiar with it, it's a, a figure in Greek mythology, three animals all in one, also refers to something that is uh, illusory and impossible to achieve, uh, but much hoped for. So some of the work that I've been doing over the last couple of years has focused on Russia, and what I am going to talk about today is an understanding of three separate actors conducting influence operations, all attributed to Russia, varying degrees of um, official attribution to the government versus the plausible deniability of being uh, third-party actors. So this is um, a presentation of some work. I did the Internet Research Agency work last year on behalf of the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence uh, through their TAG program. Um, the GRU work was conducted similarly under that rubric. We put it out on Tuesday, which was the night before the impeachment hearing started, so I'm assuming that nobody saw it. <laughs> uh, and then finally, a uh, Wagner Group, which is um, going to discuss some operations attributed to Yevgeny Prigozhin. Various entities uh, attributed to Prigozhin. Wagner is his paramilitary organization. For those who don't know, it primarily is uh, physical kinetic operations, not influence operations. But we've been observing some really interesting evolving tactics. So I want to talk about how we see these three entities working together, uh, or not working together in a coordinated sense, but working together temporarily, topically, uh, to advance geopolitical and other interests uh, attributed to the Russian state. So many of you have seen Internet Research Agency stuff before, so I'm just going to go over some of the real highlights that defined that operation, uh, particularly how we think about it in terms of a tactical playbook. And what I want to do is I want to compare and contrast the tactical playbook that has now come to be synonymous with the Russian playbook in a lot of press coverage, uh, and to talk about what we see, what we thought the Russian playbook was when the Internet Research Agency was our primary uh, data source, and then how our belief uh, in that has changed and evolved given what we've now seen with GRU and the Prigozhin operation. So if we were to summarize the Internet Research Agency's operative um, framework in one slide, I think I would say mimetic propaganda uh, and social manipulation. So the operation was carried out, it was a very social first operation on social platforms uh, di presented directly to people. So the kind of false peer-to-peer -peer Russian trolls communicating with uh, and uh, American audiences. Um, the idea of mimetic propaganda, I'm going to talk a little bit about narrative propaganda as the other side of this uh, kind of divergent pathway. But when I talk about mimetic propaganda, what I'm referring to is uh, memes, which are units of cultural capital in the academic definition of the term. And what it means is content produced really with remix culture in mind. Uh, content produced really intended to be picked up and reshared and spread through communities virally. That is, in fact, the central point of that kind of content. So this is uh, an example. I would say one of the things that the Internet Research Agency did is a phenomenally effective audience segmentation. So the key to a successful social operation is to know who you're targeting. This is a meme from an Instagram account called Angry Eagle. Uh, this is, um, I think, repurposed from Turning Point USA, but they repurposed actually a lot of Turning Point USA content. And what they're doing here is they're really getting at the kind of younger, far-right conservative irony culture. Their pages that were targeting the right for older audiences was much more freedom and American flags and Ronald Reagan. So even within the idea of segmenting for the American right, there's a degree of micro-segmentation. We see that with the other communities that they target too. Um, a lot of the, t the content targeting the African-American community had some mainstream stuff, but then it also went down into Egyptology and a couple of um, more niche uh, topics of interest to the African-American community. So when we look at this content, one of the things that we were doing uh, for the Senate was working on understanding to what extent they created versus repurposed. This is an example, um, I know the, it's kind of hard to see, but up there, November 7th, 2014, a real person posted that meme to a message board, and then it appears in 2016 on two different uh, internet research agency pages, but the oldest place that we were able to trace it back to was actually that message board in 2014. So they're going and they're grabbing stuff, and then they're bringing it up at times when it is uh, narratively appropriate for the American conversation. We look at the way that they evolve their accounts, so they're constantly checking to see if they're succeeding, and when the account topic is not hitting its stride with an audience, they change it. So the 
page Army of Jesus that everybody talks about because it has the Jesus fighting Hillary Clinton actually started off as an Instagram account uh, that posted Miss Piggy and Kermit the Frog memes. When that did not <laughs> really like strike it with the American uh, youth, they moved to Simpsons memes. Um, and then following that, they really hit their stride a full year later um, when they turned it into the Jesus page and then it takes off from there. So you see this idea of a social first operation, the same way you would run a social media marketing agency, where you are constantly evolving your content and tailoring it over time. Uh, we see sophisticated, significant engagement on some of the content, so over 700,000 on that one, and then the, uh, the Yosemite Sam in the corner there, uh, close to a million engagements, 986,000. What they then do is when they have their high engaging content, they repurpose it several times. You'll see the same memes repeated across pages. They'll just rebrand them uh, with a new logo. And of course, the point of sticking the logo on there is so that anybody who sees that meme after it's been virally shared can trace it back to the source and follow the page or account. So it's almost a calling card. The purpose of it is to, uh, to assist in audience acquisition uh, free of having to, to buy and run ads. Thank you so much. Um, so what do they do with this? They have all of their accounts, and then they begin to interlink them. So what we see with the interlinking is, this is one page, uh, Black Matters US. This page in particular goes, and they create content across every social platform. The thing on the right there is actually a sticker pack that was um, just something you could download uh, in the App Store. And so they make all of this stuff. They create an, like ecosystems of content for each of their micro brands or pages, and then they interlink them. And so what we have here is just crawling the network, looking at what account mentioned what other account. And I know that this is unfortunately an absolutely terrible slide for this room. <laughs> but, um, but what you see is blue dots are accounts that the IRA did not own but mentioned and red accounts are uh, accounts that the IRA owned. And so this is where we see them engaging with other real authentic members of the community and accounts promoting their content and trying to have their content promoted in return. So they work as hard as possible to interlink their accounts so that when you're seeing one of them, you're seeing content from more of them, and you are also seeing their content be promoted by authentic trusted brands. A similar analysis done on the hashtags. This was looking at hashtags that were used over a thousand times. Um, you can't see it again, sorry. <laughs> the slides will be up online. Um, but what we were looking at here was ways in which they played into using hashtags as a way not only to attract audiences, but this was where you started to see a visual representation of what social division looks like. Uh, there's a cluster in the center there that links the left-leaning and the right-leaning content, uh, and it's talking about police. And so they're using the hashtag police for both the uh, Blue Lives Matter and Black Lives Matter content. They use a range of hashtags related to that police, cop, officer. Um, and so if you were to click into that hashtag, you would see their accounts you know, on both the kind of positive pro-police and the negative anti-police uh, side. So it does create, again, this opportunity to, uh, to generate tension in particular contentious hashtags. Uh, another area that was also shared in common was uh, religious. There was a lot of uh, Jesus hashtags that linked both communities. This is a look at uh, Twitter activity. So you do see evidence. That these were uh, plotting accounts and then the times that they tweeted. So you do see some blocks that existed primarily to, uh, to amplify content at the same time. Graphica did a really excellent report on this with OII also. And they went deep into the Twitter stuff. So um, I, would, uh, I would point to their work for deeper assessments of the 10 and a half million tweets that we found. This, of course, all leads up to targeting and recruitment of the unwitting. So they move the operation once they have the brands established. This is where it becomes a human operation. This is where it becomes uh, directly engaging with communities, infiltrating communities, and putting communities to work for them. This is where I'm going to talk about this in the context of Wagner Group. Uh, this is where you start to see the deviation from being just a social media marketing agency to being something that becomes actually quite a bit uh, more nefarious because what they do once they have that community infiltration uh, is they encourage people to get out into the streets and protest. They encourage them to ramp up their activism. Uh, and there were, in fact, a number of protests that were coordinated on Facebook uh, from Russia that manifested as in the streets conflict in the US. So now turning to a completely different actor, so GRU is um, Russian military intelligence, and directly uh, 
you know, working for the Kremlin, not in any way one degree removed by uh, its affiliation with Evgeny Prigozhin, no plausible deniability here. Uh, this is an operation that is being run at the same time and actually starts uh, a lot of the early content from both the Internet Research Agency and the GRU targets the Ukraine and they gradually move into the US. What we see from the GRU, and apologies if you can't see this clearly, but that there's a vertical line showing where the US election is just to kind of help anchor it. Uh, there are about 28 pages. So uh, Facebook did the attribution. Facebook provided to the Senate Intelligence Committee a folder containing 28 pages worth of uh, Facebook pages worth of data, uh, which we treated as the basis for an open source intelligence investigation to try to understand how these operations were carried out, where they appeared off Facebook, and what the playbook they ran was. So this is happening at the same time as the IRA. And you see the GRU make a couple of like weak forays into memes. Um, interestingly, you see a much more geopolitically aligned, cluster, a geopolitically oriented cluster of operations here. So not so much societal divisions, but much more about persuasion, much more about not dividing uh, people, but just persuading them towards a state-sanctioned point of view. So the social operation, uh, I would classify as a failure. And what I mean by that is at the same time that the IRA is generating hundreds of millions of engagements, uh, hundreds of thousands of likes and shares on its content, growing these pages to audiences of 500,000 uh, for the, the more successful ones, what you see is the GRU largely flopping. So the total engagement, as in all likes, shares, comments, and um, or basically likes, shares, comments, uh, is over there in total engagement, or reactions, the reactie. Um, and then over there, you have the name of the, the post, so the uh, post that the, I'm sorry, the page that they spent the most time on was Inside Syria Media Center, which I'm gonna focus a little bit on. Um, Cernogora News Agency was a fake news agency targeting Montenegro. Um, uh, Southern Front, I'm gonna touch on a little bit too. You see fancy bears in there. The two that touched on race were Michael Brown Memorial and Baltimore is Everywhere. So the same time that the IRA is running these remarkably successful pages targeting the black community, the GRU is putting out feelers, but it doesn't lift. What they do manage to achieve is an update of the old KGB tactic of narrative laundering. So in the narrative laundering framework of Russian disinformation, the goal is really uh, to manipulate the media into taking a story, something that they want to have placed and covered, and then to work it through publications of higher and higher degrees of quality, and then by establishing the repetition, the citation chain, uh, the increasing legitimacy of better publications, you can push that narrative into popular awareness and make people, uh, you know, treat it as a, uh, as, a, as a valid point of view or a thing that people are talking about. The canonical example of this is Operation Infection and the narrative that was pushed saying that the CIA created AIDS. It took years uh, to actually make that narrative take hold, but what we see now is the update, the digital update for that strategy. So this is the Inside Syria Media Center. If you've ever consumed a small independent media or news site online, you realize that this looks absolutely identical to that. Uh, it has bylines, it has about seven or eight people, different bylines uh, working for it. They claim to be investigative reporters working in Syria. Um, one of the things we see in addition to the fake publications are fake people who are writing for them. Uh, this is a gentleman by the name of Andrew Kolkovich. He does not appear to exist. Uh, Andrew Koltkovich had bylines on Newsland.com, which is a real news site. Uh, he posted on Facebook and Twitter. You start to see, he posted on Quora, um, Medium account, I think, for this one too. What you start to see is they create these front organizations, then they create front personas. The front personas write for one front organization and promote content from another. So one of the things that we were doing in this process was understanding who the creators were, who the distributors were, and what that network looked like. And so the green dots here are entities that we established as fake personas. And we did this through a series of methods much like what um, Bellingcat was describing. We actually did in fact reach out to a couple of uh, other entities, to uh, other research entities to verify some of our assumptions on this. 
Um, one of the things that's really interesting is that occasionally you'll see a lead, like DFR Lab will have put out a post where they allude to something where they aren't making a concrete attribution, but they're saying something about this looks weird. And one of these accounts, uh, Adamus Abramaitis, uh, they refer to in the context of a weird operation targeting NATO out of Lithuania, we see him come into play via a different direction uh, attributed to some of the GRU content. So we can't say with any real concrete claim that he is in fact attributable to the GRU. We point to adjacencies between these operations. Um, this is where you start to see, this is the, uh, the green dots are the personas, the pink circles are the publications that they write for. So this is where Miriam Al-Hijab and Mehmet Ersoy were both purportedly um, reporters for Inside Syria Media Center. So is Anna Junger, so is Sophie Mangal. Um, none of those people exist, but by virtue of their byline on Inside Syria Media Center and Inside Syria Media Center's thousands of posts, they then pitch real publications uh, and say, hey, I'm a contributing writer and I would like to place my story in your publication. So this is how that narrative laundering uh, takes place. And what you see is some of these publications, I see some people smiling at the high quality publications in there. <laughs> um, that's where you start to see, again, that, that one degree of legitimacy. Some of these pages, like Veterans Today, uh, do have dedicated readership. You also see interesting responses. Um, the, this is the update of the, Al this is the Alice Donovan playbook for anybody who is really into Russian influence operations. Alice Donovan was one of these fake personas uh, who actually plagiarized content from inside Syria Media Center. So they're not always the most careful. Sometimes this, like that act of plagiarism got Alice caught by counterpunch. Uh, and then it turns out actually that the FBI reached out as well and said, uh, we believe that that persona is attributable to Russian intelligence. The Duran's response to that was actually to say, um, there's no possible way this is Russian intelligence. It's probably just a young writer who wants to remain anonymous. Um, in addition to the network of content creators, we see these aligned personas where, again, we don't fully know what they are. We can't make a concrete attribution, but we can tell you that Olga Gromova here does not look like that. That's a stolen photo. All of her photos, in fact, are stolen. We see her go into groups. They also had groups affiliated with some of these pages. And we see her regularly posting uh, strongly Russian government aligned narratives on everything from MH17 to Skripal to other issues. So we can't say, of course, that she is a persona, but we can say that she engages in groups related to these pages that are attributable to the GRU. And we start to see this network of people who socialize the content uh, and try to just kind of keep that narrative um, going in the groups that they're establishing. The other thing that the GRU does that the IRA does not do is the hack and leak operations. So this is the uh, APT28, the Fancy Bear hacks, uh, and some of the things that we see in the Fancy Bear hacks are discussed in the report. I don't have time to go into it, but if you search for uh, Stanford FSI Internet Observatory, uh, you will find it. Um, we do see that Fancy Bear and, and, um, and DC Leaks in particular were also flops on social media. So the real lift of the hack and leak operations comes from the engagement with the journalists. So this is a very distinctive strategy. They are not able to put out their own content on social media and get lift. It's really through WikiLeaks and then through journalists that you start to see pick up in those stories. So it's much more... Uh, the, the operation is to manipulate and to uh, feed content to the media. Commonalities, we see the creation of personas. Uh, we see tons of attention to Syria between both the GRU and the IRA data set. And this is an area that we are still investigating to try to fully understand. Uh, we, we don't believe that we can, we, we can't assert coordination based on just topical or temporal um, signals, what we say is there is an interesting degree of, uh, of effort that the IRA put into Syria, given that most American audiences do not care about Syria. But there are over a thousand posts related to Syria uh, that echo the themes, 
the uh, GRU does it narratively. They want to talk about very specific aspects of the Syria conflict. The IRA does it mimetically. And if you read the posts that go above these memes on Facebook, you see really persuasive content designed to make Americans feel a particular way. So not the academic discussion of Syria, but much more, you should care about this if you care about refugees. You should care about this if you hate refugees. Um, we see the IRA created pages pretending to be uh, anonymous, so they had a, you know, a Euronon news clone. Um, and what we see in the GRU data set is actually some interesting stuff that ties it back to cyber recruit. This is another area that requires further investigation because it, it, they, they have this sort of cyber recruit iconography att attributed to some of these, uh, one of these pages, uh, Southfront. Um, they are talking about topics that Cyber Recruit cares about, but they're also putting out a bunch of conspiratorial, like 9-11 truther content and things that just doesn't um, align with the more uh, kind of body of literature around Cyber Recruit, but we do see this appear in the GRU data set. Uh, and then you have this remarkable, I don't know, the uh, Seth Rich conspiracy theory, I imagine a lot of you are familiar with it, the conspiracy theory is that Russia did not hack the DNC at all. It was actually this man, Seth Rich, who was murdered in DC. Uh, Julian Assange insinuated in an interview that Rich was his source. So here we have, again, the Internet Research Agency socializing repeatedly on multiple occasions what a great guy uh, Julian Assange is uh, and perpetuating the Seth Rich conspiracy theory. Again, not evidence of coordination, but Temporarily, we do see these interesting links in which the IRA is socializing the propaganda that uh, it attempts to obscure the GRU activity. So that was the old stuff. And now, um, about late October, we, we um, came to do this work, which is, I think, the most up-to-date takedown of Russian, uh, Russian attributable content. Again, this is attributable to Yevgeny Prigozhin, who owns or funds the Internet Research Agency. There is some uh, back and forth about that. Um, Wagner Group, as I mentioned, is the paramilitary organization. There was a line in an article about Africa, which Wagner Group is extremely active in Africa, and a Daily Beast reporter wrote an article and said that somebody was saying that Wagner Group was running an influence operation related to, a Libyan, to the Libyan election. And we thought that that was very interesting because why would Prigozhin run an influence operation out of Wagner Group when he has the IRA? So our initial thought was that that had been misattributed, in fact, that it was an IRA page. And then we thought, well, we'll go look for the IRA activity in Libya because, you know, <laughs> why not? Um, so we did, in fact, uh, then begin to do a, a Dr. Shelby Grossman, one of the people uh, in the Internet Research, uh, sorry, in the um, Internet Observatory, uh, is the person who did a lot of the early findings here. We start to look at, and I apologize, my speaker notes have the translation, I would butcher this, but you see the, um, the mimetic approach here. So again, this is a really interesting operation because it's attributable to an entire other entity. Um, we took this cluster of Libya pages that we found, we gave it to Facebook and we said, we have the, the link to Wagner Group came through a dossier center assessment. Um, can you verify or what, what do you think this is? Facebook responded back with, this actually appears to tie into several other operations that we are looking at spread out across Africa. So this was actually a really great example of how uh, you know, independent and academic researchers can in fact collaborate with the platforms. Um, we see the, again, the mimetic content and then we also see, though, at the same time, the creation of multiple uh, front newspapers and media entities. So there is some, um, the idea of like a distinct playbook, it's actually really an evolving playbook, a very blended playbook that is using both the mimetic and the narrative, reaching different audiences using the, the, two, uh, the two approaches. Um, what we see here is the, again, Africa is a, fascinating organization. It, they were uh, running a, um, a summit of African leaders. The narrative that they've been putting out is that the US has abandoned Africa, Europe has abandoned Africa, but Russia uh, is here as an ally. And so there's again this creation of these think tanks and entities and media organizations um, that are not always what they seem to be. 
And then one of the other things that we see here is the movement into closed spaces. So this is WhatsApp and Telegram. So they're running WhatsApp and Telegram channels as well. Um, you can, in fact, click in. You can uh, click into the Telegram channel. It's kind of like a, a lobby, basically. So this stuff was you know, viewable online. Uh, and we did go and look to see what kind of activity was, was happening in there. And so they're in there. And uh, it's sort of like a landing page. You can then be moved into more interesting groups. So it's, again, that opportunity to establish uh, extremely personal one-on-one -on -one contact with communities as well. Um, the most remarkable thing here and where I think a lot of this is going is actually the recruiting of, um, of, of Sudanese nationals. So uh, they ran a couple pages out of Sudan and they recruited locals to serve as reporters. So again, that same IRA approach where they were leaning into the black community trying to get people to write for them and, uh, and do things for them. Uh, you see them actually, it appears, to succeed in this particular area. Um, the interesting thing with some of these accounts is, again, we didn't feel really comfortable releasing a lot of information um, about the people who appeared to be affiliated with the operation. Uh, some of them had studied in Russia. Um, some of them were, um, you know, they, they were taking like Facebook Lives at Russian craft fairs and things like that. And it's interesting to see these ties and to see how they're um, pulling people from the community and really leveraging like the latest and greatest, every new feature, every new platform. Um, it is a constantly evolving, expanding way to try to uh, execute influence. And um, I'm gonna leave some time for questions. So I guess I would say we are thinking about this now in terms of um, can we really declare that there is a playbook given the expansive, evolving, uh, constant, iterative process that we see here. Uh, we're thinking a lot about what does the 2020 election look like in the US, not to bring everything back to the US, but um, just to say that franchise model is really challenging, it's really problematic, because attribution is getting harder and harder, uh, particularly as the pages are not managed overseas, even the transparency features that you would see would look like it was coming from the US, the ads will look like they are coming from the US. So how do we think about influence operations when they are no longer making the mistakes that they made, and we really are limited to looking at the content, uh, who is putting it out, and the dissemination patterns, anomalous distribution. But it's actually um, now at this point, I think, impossible to do the work solely from the outside perspective. It really does require um, constant checks with other open source researchers, um, constant checks with the platforms, and just ways to share tips and share information so that we can have a better mechanism uh, for detection and mitigation going forward. So, thank you. Dan Ellis, MITRE. Targeting is a key way that many um, att attribution activities are conducted. How much chaff do they put in their signal to conceal their real intent and to, to mask what they're really after. Do you mean in terms of the narrative or in terms of... Um... Narrative, memes, how much additional data do they put in there to blend in and... Uh, it takes additional effort, uh -huh. but it would make attribution much harder. Or, or would it? I, you know, the... Uh... The cyber recruit content with the weird 9-11 stuff in there um, did make us think that maybe it was a misattribution or maybe it wasn't, the, maybe, you know, we are always reliant on the attribution from the platform, well, the communication back and forth with the platform. It's kind of a collaboratively determined thing. Sometimes the pages are attributed before, uh, before I see them. Um, with, the, with the IRA stuff, in 2017, they ran a rather extensive campaign mocking the idea of Russian trolls. And it was very well done. It's really, really excellent content, actually. Um, it was, you know, you know, the meme of a little girl, mommy, there's monsters under my bed. No, it's just the Russians. Um, there's like Hillary Clinton, everybody I don't like is a Russian spy. RT ran this campaign in the, uh, in the airports in Russia that was remarkable, that was basically like, Mr. Flight, like blame Russia. You know, and so creating this idea that um, it is absolutely ludicrous to think that they would be doing that, and it was them, in fact, putting out this content. Another thing that they did a lot of was uh, they complained constantly that they were being censored when the platforms moderated them. 
So as they started to lose assets, as they started to lose pages, you see them putting out this narrative that Facebook is censoring them and that this is all um, a vast conspiracy to censor conservatives because some of those pages were the first to come down. So it's um, really hard, even with that stuff, to trace it back to where, you know, the chicken or egg problem, where did it come from, who said it first? We're always trying to figure out the best way to do that. For something like narrative content, it's easy because most of the bylined articles, you can, you will have a timestamp on whatever site they appear on. So we can actually track the spread of the narrative stuff. The mimetic stuff, the entire point is that it goes viral and then you have an absolutely impossible task of trying to figure out uh, you know, where the initial seed actually was because it's hopping from platform to platform. So a little bit of a, of a, of a different detection challenge there. Um, hi, uh, Joe Uchel from Axios. Uh, sorry for not standing. I have a laptop in my lap and I'm fairly clumsy. Um, you, you sort of, you, you mentioned it, but I don't think you ever actually explained what the answer was. Why? Why use Wagner when you have the IRA? I actually don't know. Um, I don't have any answer to that. I, it wasn't just Wagner. If you read the report, um, the way that, that we and Facebook came down on it was a collection of entities attributed to Yevgeny Prigozhin. Uh, there are debates about who owns Wagner, to what extent Wagner exists, whether Wagner is an, you know, a, uh, an unacknowledged um, GRU asset, um, or you know, like, a, like a black ops unit. Um, there is not a whole lot that is really understood about that you know, Concord management and that cluster of companies. Um, I think that's where one of the challenges for doing the attribution comes from. In Libya, one, one, of the, one of the reasons that Wagner came up is because Wagner is in fact operational in those countries. It's been widely reported on their activities in CAR, in CAR, in, um, in Libya, uh, other places, and so this was seen as um, <clears throat> a value-added service. So they were there, and they were working on behalf of political parties and entities. They were also there for personal enrichment related to Prigozhin's economic interests, uh, and so there is a, you know, there's a theory also that IRA may in fact be franchised and, and spread around at some point, that why would you keep all of your assets in one place when you can move to this distributed model? But I don't think anybody really has a strong answer on that. Um, yeah, so it's, it's great to do all this reporting on what the adversaries are doing, but there's also the other side of what the audience is doing and how they're retweeting and reamplifying this stuff. I, I know that the platforms have made some effort to try to tell those people you've been duped. Yeah. Has there been any studies into how receptive they are to that message or whether they just resist it? So there's a couple. Um, with regard to the IRA data set was attributed by the platforms, provided to SISI, and then uh, given to a couple of teams. We were not given the comments, so we couldn't see how people were engaging with it. So we could quote the 167 million engagement stat, but we can't tell you what they said back to a given voter suppression meme. And that was a huge gap in understanding, uh, and it is, it is called out very clearly uh, in that report from last year. With the newer stuff, um, similarly, we were not given any comments, but it wasn't really a social first operation. But we did track them around to a bunch of different web forums. And one of the things that was remarkable was the Montenegrins just calling it out. Nope, you're a Kremlin troll. I mean, just right out there. So it was really interesting to see that degree of, um, you know, you're a bullshit artist trying to interfere in our political ecosystem like we're not having it. Uh, so that was, you know, heartening. <laughs> um, the Wagner stuff, because that was live, did mean that we could see all of the comments um, for the first time. We elected for privacy reasons not to put out many screenshots of them. They ran the gamut. Some of it was, um, you know, the, particularly the pro-Qaddafi. So Qaddafi's son is running for, pre is one of the presidential candidates. Uh, so there are these uh, pages dedicated to Qaddafi and you do see some people like saying, like what is this garbage that you're putting up, like extolling the you know, majesty of Qaddafi, like you didn't live in Libya during that time clearly. So you do see some of that, but then you also see a lot of people just engaging with the content. Uh, and so I, there haven't, you know, on the interventions front, um, 
the, both Facebook and Twitter did, in response to the Senate uh, hearing request, notify people. <coughs> it's, it's sort of unclear that people were very receptive to that because it was so highly politicized. I mean, our report came out before the Mueller report and our report was politicized. And that was a, you know, I think a um, really challenging because it was very hard for people to divorce what had happened from the political outcome that they wanted. Um, and so you got some feedback back like, um, well, who cares if it was the Russians saying that Hillary's awful, I think Hillary's awful too. How does the activity that you've uh, been describing uh, as a tribute to those three Russian groups compare to the activity that we've learned about Cambridge Analytica in the 2016 U.S. election and the Brexit referendum in you documentaries the, the like in The Great Hack? Yeah, like how, how, does, how does what they do differ from what you see these Russian groups doing? The Internet Research Agency ran a lot of ads. Those ads have, in fact, uh, that data set is public, so anyone can go look at that. Um, I felt like ads were a very, it's a strategy that you don't see them using as much anymore. It's just not really the point. If you want to attract attention, you can take content aligned with how people feel and go into a Facebook group and throw it into the Facebook group. People are telling you who they are. You don't need to pay money to find them. One of the things, not related to Russia, but um, we helped with a takedown related to a spam network out of Kosovo running Blue Lives Matter pages. And here too, we could see all of the comments and you could click on the Facebook transparency button and see that it was being run out of Kosovo. Nobody seemed to care. They were just happy to engage with this content. I think it's a, uh, and, and there was not a single ad that was run by that page. They were just going into real Blue Lives Matter groups, uh, dropping their content, dropping their memes, and getting incredible engagement, uh, purely because it was just narratively aligned and made people feel good. And that's where I think, when I talk about, um, I, I understand people thinking ads are a vulnerability. I think they are for other reasons. I think micro-targeting is a significant challenge for other reasons. I don't think that, that changing political ads is any kind of cure-all for a disinformation campaign because there are so many other ways to reach the people that you want to reach on the internet. Uh, hi, my name is Zach, I work at Google. Um, I'm curious, do you have any indication the degree to which the uh, locally hired operators you mentioned <laughs> understand that they're working as part of an information operation for Wagner Group, or do they just think I'm a normal journalist working for a normal journalistic outlet? We really don't have a very good answer for that. So um, a couple of reporters did reach out. So this was not, this is, as far as I'm concerned, that's not a thing that we are going to do. We're not gonna do that kind of ethnographic research. Um, the, a few reporters did reach out. Um, some of the response was very much like, what, so you're, you know, so I can't go to Russia, I can't be a student in Russia and also be a reporter in Sudan. Um, one, uh, one reporter, I think, said in her article that um, when she explained what was going on, the person just sort of said, oh shit, and then stopped talking to her. Under, unclear if that was an oh shit, like we got found out or, you know, because Facebook didn't tell them why their page came down apparently, it just took them, you know, took it down and sent a, you know, I guess, the usual form that you get if you're depublished. Um, so that was interesting. I don't think that we really know. Um, I wish I had a better answer for you on that one. <laughs> 